Hello and welcome to Let's Talk Acne, our master's aesthetic course. On today's course, we're going to go through several things regarding acne, what I call the four hot topics of acne. First is understanding and identifying the different types of acne lesions. The second is to correct those conditions through effective treatment plans and home care regimens for results. We also want to be cognizant of reducing or normalizing inflammation typically associated with acne. We'll also touch base on extractions. What are the best practices for safe and effective extractions? With literally hundreds of different acne treatments available for your clients to choose from, it can be very confusing to them and to us to try to decide what works best and what works doesn't work. My goal today is to provide you with the information to help you deal with your acne-prone clients, not only walk you through how to identify, but also then how to create the perfect treatment plan for that particular client. There are many different ways to not only correct acne and the conditions associated with acne, but to prevent it before it really occurs. So let's take a look deeper and understand what acne really is. Did you know that acne is affecting more than 60 million people in the United States? Over 80% of the population is affected during their teen years. Almost everyone will have some form of acne throughout their lifetime. Most get very mild cases, some moderate, and a few very severe. This creates a very big demographic of clients really needing your expertise or opinion on the treatment for their acne. The course of acne is really punctuated with cycles and frequent flare-ups in the affected areas, regardless if it's mild, moderate, or severe. Hence, we should always take the approach when treating acne as a chronic skin disorder, which really requires a preventative corrective treatment and home care along with a maintenance program to control the condition. During the adolescence years, acne can have a lot of psychosocial impacts, which makes it a sensitive condition to handle. We must be really equipped with the right knowledge and proper care that's paramount to make sure that we're doing the right things for these already sensitive teens. Many factors play a role in the causation of acne. Hereditary predisposition plays a very big role. The effect of our hormones. Many other external and internal factors such as diet, stress, environmental exposure, grime, city grime, improper use of products. And after puberty, these hormones actually stimulate the sebaceous gland to increase their size and therefore produce more sebum. There is something to be said about the relevance between the gland size and pore size. If your clients tend to have larger pore sizes, it's directly related to the gland itself. If they have a larger sebaceous gland, they're more apt to produce more oil. This oil or sebum is a good growth media for certain bacteria, which is then turns into an inflammation within the hair follicle and the surrounding dermal structures. This is when we start to see acne start to fester. Depending on the severity of the inflammation, the type of acne also varies in different individuals and at different times within the same individual. It's not uncommon for us to be treating different types of acne within the same client's skin. So what is the age incidence of acne? Contrary to popular belief, acne can occur at any age, really from neonatal to a very mature age. Typically, however, acne is seen in early puberty to the early adulthood. The average aging is between 12 and 25 years of old. About 50% of teenage acne can continue through adulthood. So herein lies the reason why I really stress preventative care with my clients. A lot of the prolonged effect of acne can be avoided by simply putting them on a really good maintenance program. Some people, especially females, tend to have occasional flare-ups well into their 30s, where men start to subside. At the age of 40, 1% of males and 5% of females still have acne lesions that are very active. So does acne differ in male and female, and do we treat it any differently? Well, males and females are both affected in acne albeit somewhat differently. The severity of acne is more common in males. 
almost all boys and 90% of girls will have some form of acne during their teen years. Acne, nodular cystic acne, is more common amongst males. This is the type of acne lesions that you see along the jawbone and neck uh, of most males entering into their early teens or into their early 20s. What are the common areas affected by acne? Well, it really, it does and can develop on any hair bearing area. So obviously, it's most commonly seen on the face. It can be also seen in other areas of the body where there's a maximum density of sebaceous glands that's attributed to also hair growth. In the forehead, cheeks, nose, chin, and neck are the mostly affected and in that order most of the time. It's not uncommon to see what I refer to as the wave of acne. It typically starts in the forehead. They'll get slight breakouts there. It'll slowly work down to the cheeks and nose and then the, down to the chin and then onto the neck and onto the body. But in the same way, it starts to clear. So once we start to see clearing genetically, in the forehead, it will then start to clear in the cheeks, the nose, chin, and neck, and then the body is last to respond. So it is truly a wave on the onset and in the clearing process. Remember that acne also occurs on our chest, shoulders, upper back, buttocks, and thighs. And so when a client is likely to have acne lesions on the face and neck, there is a slight chance that they may also have it on the body. So it's a good idea to address what they're currently using for their body washes and such to make sure that we're providing them with the right tools for them at home. So the role of different factors in the development of acne, first of all, I think it's a very multifactorial skin condition. There's usually not one thing that's associated with the onset of acne. However, there are some things that we need to take into consideration that across the board are pretty much found with most acne sufferers. Genetics, hormonal in fluctuations, dietary and environmental factors, all of these have been known to contribute greatly to the development of acne. There's a great tendency toward more serious acne if one or both parents have had severe acne during their youth or in their 20s. But there are four etiological factors that we take into consideration in all acne development. One is that we know that there's an increased amount of oil production regardless of why. Perhaps this is uh, genetic, perhaps it's through the onset of heat and stimulation, uh, it could be on the onset of the wrong types of products. It could be hormonal and fluctuations going on at an early age. But regardless, increased sebum production results in more potential for acne development. Also, the hyperproliferation of dead skin cells, not only on the surface of the skin, but throughout the pores. This hypercortification or overproduction of cells also lines the follicles. This results in sometimes closures of the ducts or the orifice opening of the pore and causes comedones or acne to fester or to begin to develop simply because the skin cannot exfoliate it. Bacterial colonization within the duct or pore is probably one of the most pronounced reasons why it festers and continues to get worse. So the best thing we can do is to control bacterial growth deep within the pore. This propion bacterium bacteria, or otherwise known as P. acne or P. acneum bacterium, is the acne that's responsible for festering inflammation and pus formation deep within the pore when left untreated. So further production of inflammation in the acne sites also can cause damage in the surrounding healthy tissue. So we want to avoid inflammation as much as possible. So the manifestations of acne, clearly, they're divided into two major groups, inflammatory and non-inflammatory lesions. The skin treatment of these two types of acne vary. Non-inflammatory lesions, or comedones, are subdivided into whiteheads and blackheads. Whiteheads are your closed comedones and phyllosebaceous duct cornification. This just means there's lots of filament and debris within the pore. Blackheads or open comedones are present as an obvious black lesion, especially on the very top of the skin. This ranges in about one to three millimeters in diameter. 
The accumulation of melanin or skin pigment in blackheads cause the black color or through what we know as oxidation. There are many clients who have few or no blackheads but still have filament or congestion in the pores. Manifestation of adult acne of whiteheads and blackheads is very common and they may be a starting point for more an inflammatory type acne lesions if left untreated. Therefore, it's necessary that our clients come in for regular facials along with thorough extractions just to ensure that we're keeping their pores clean. Inflammatory lesions such as papules or pustules and even more so nodules or cystic type acne are amongst other manifestations of acne when it's left untreated beginning at the very genesis of the pore. Papules and pustules are more superficial compared to the rest of the inflammatory type acne lesions and their correction takes a bit shorter amount of time. Within five to 10 days of topicals and or along with a facial that's designed to treat non-inflamed or inflamed acne, we can see results in a very short period of time as little as five to 10 days. These certain breakouts uh, are really caused by blockage of oil glands. So it's really critical that in the treatment plan, as well as maybe more importantly, in the home care regimen, that we're using or recommending products that are continually keeping the pores clean and functioning normal. Papules are red lesions. These are pimples. Pustules are similar to papules, but with a central collection of white pus at the top. This means that it's starting to fester, and this is where we start to see the collateral damage because those white blood cells are going to start eliminating and breaking down healthy cells or healthy tissue surrounding the pustule themselves. Nodules are real deep-seated structures. They tend to remain for as long as up to eight weeks before possibly resolving themselves. So within these different types of manifestations of acne, we have to look at different ways that we can correct the conditions associated with them. Cysts or cystic acne are not very common, but when they occur, um, they can reach several centimeters in diameter. These are not typically follicular. These are uh, an inflammatory uh, disorder of the sebaceous gland. And in this case, it's outside the scope of practice for estheticians, and it does require us to refer them to a dermatologist or to a healthcare provider for treatment. These are very tender, sensitive, and very deep. Uh, lots of bacterial growth. Uh, this can also lead to lots of scarring if left untreated, and it takes longer periods of time for the, to correct these types of acne conditions, and reoccurrence is very likely. So again, we do recommend that they take um, uh, themselves to the physician. Hormonal factors in acne, there are such things as hormonal fluctuations among some of the causes of acne. Sebaceous glands are extremely sensitive to these types of hormonal fluctuations. In fact, when we stimulate testosterone, it actually stimulates the oil gland. And the enlargement of this proceeds to obviously more oil production. They're also under endocrine control, and so it's not surprising that oil production varies with age and sex. Males have a significantly greater sebum production than females. The sebum production continues and increases after puberty, puberty and reaching peaks in both male and female between 30 and 40 years of age. Therefore, there's a gradual decline. There are some emotional factors and acne that we should take into consideration as well. As with any disease or disorder which is prolonged, the importance of the psychological factors in the treatment of these breakouts has been repeatedly stressful and should be seriously taken into consideration when using topical treatments. If the client is already stressed out, the skin has lots of inflammation and soreness, we should take all that into consideration when we're uh, creating their treatment plan and home care regimen. There seems to be no doubt, however, that real stressful situations like exams or stressful situations in family dynamics, all those types of things can cause acne exacerbations in some clients. There's probably the result of increased steroid secretion by the adrenal glands that seem to potentiate the effect of hormonal fluctuation. So again, those darn hormones, whenever they're fluctuated, have a tendency to either stimulate or aggravate the sebaceous gland, which then in turn creates more sebaceous activity, creating more oil in the, in the gland or in the pore itself, and then creating, again, that great environment for bacterial 
infestation. So some environmental factors also play a role here. Obviously, uh, we know that manifestation of acne is worse in the winter and improves during the summer. This suggests that the effects of sunlight can be positive or vitamin D can be positive on the effects of acne. Constant friction caused by protective devices such as helmets, shoulder pads, pillows, sunglasses, glasses also needs to be taken into consideration when we try to manage uh, a really tough acne. So what are the common signs and symptoms? Well, we already talked about this, but we'll briefly go over it again. They'll typically start out with little whiteheads or blackheads in the very early stages. Depending on the severity, it's divided then into two types, um, and, and actually it's four types, I should say. Uh, comedonal acne, which is considered our grade one, this is a very non-inflammatory type of acne, typically associated with lots of blackheads and open comedones, something that looks like this. The papular acne, which is a grade two, starts to show some signs of inflammation. Uh, we start to see a little bit of more redness uh, and raised type lesions with this grade two. And then we have our postular acne, which is grade three. We're starting to see a lot more redness and inflammation in the surrounding tissue. And then we have your nodulocystic or grade four, which is outside the scope of practice for estheticians in all 50 states. So, and that tends to look a little bit more like this. So you can see though, it starts out really as a comedonal grade one, when left untreated can manifest into a more of a grade two and then onto a grade three. Uh, grade four is of its own type of, of grade. Uh, again, not really associated with anything other than genetic tendencies for cystic acne. Uh, in the presence of any type of inflammation, however, we want to make sure we're addressing that as well. So you wouldn't want to add anything to the treatment plan or to the home care regimen that is going to exacerbate any redness or inflammation. The skin of acne sufferers is usually oily and most of them suffer also from dandruff, believe it or not, during a real onset of acne. Oiliness and sudden eruptions can sometimes cause an itchy sensation with acne and that's really due to the concentration of the white blood cells flooding the area. So this is typically the formation of acne, just to put it in, in this type of perspective. When left untreated, the pore looks very healthy. It's functioning healthy, uh, and it looks like there's, there's enough passage through for waste. Um, the accumulation of dead skin cells when they start usually create a plug, uh, typically towards the uh, beginning of the epidermis here. You can see, though, with the onset of more sebaceous activity, um, uh, we can start to see that this will expand. Then we start to see some bacterial growth because of the entrapment of the bacteria creating that warm environment for it to fester. And as a result, we'll create white blood cells, which is why we start to see some inflammation known as your pustule. Um, and then we start to see the rupture of this canal or follicular lining due to just an exorbitant amount of waste. Uh, and so a lots of inflammation, soreness, and pain associated with this type of pustular acne. This is just a cross-section of what the acne looks like as well from a normal healthy looking uh, skin type and, and pore to one that has an acne or blocked lesion. You can see lots of blockage on the orifice opening, uh, really uh, an inflated sebaceous uh, or hair duct and sebaceous glands. Uh, sometimes the hair may break due to the plug here, uh, which also lends to a lot more uh, inflammation and bacterial infestation here. This is where the P. acne bacterium survives well down here at the lower end of the pore or the pore itself. So inflammation develops here, and therefore we start to see the onset of white blood flow, our white blood cells, which increases inflammation and pus formation. So it's really critical that we as estheticians do whatever we can to recommend to our clients to keep the skin functioning normal, as normal as possible. And it really starts with keeping those pores clean. So again, the inflammation algorithm, I like to talk about this because inflammation is something that can really lead to so many more unwanted conditions and can be very detrimental in the aging process 
of the skin as well as well. So at all times we want to be cognizant of the level of inflammation or the sensitivity levels in which we're working on. In most cases with a really mild acne, we typically will see some localized inflammation, minimal amount of pimples, um, and or the non-inflamed uh, state of mild acne, which is usually associated with comedones and milia, um, both of which I use salicylic acid as a remedy. You'll get to know the fact that I'm not a big proponent of benzoyl peroxide um, for lots of reasons, self-taught and, and studied it and tried it on my own clients for years. And I choose salicylic over that for, again, lots of personal reasons. Um, I believe and that it's just as effective as benzoyl peroxide without creating the collateral damage that I know that benzoyl peroxide can cause and also the limitations that we're working with with benzoyl peroxide. With salicylic acid as a remedy for all skin types, all skin color, all sorts of inflammation to mild to severe, I found it to just be the best anecdote. Uh, in moderate inflammation, again, we start to see some inflammatory pustules where we start to then see the onset or potential for mild scarring, uh, which is what we really want to try to avoid. Uh, inflammation leads to scarring, there's no question. So uh, inflammation, again, is something we have to keep in mind when we're providing a treatment plan in home care is that, that we're also recommending non-inflammatories. Um, again, you'll see salicylic acid as a remedy, but also retinoic acid by prescription makes a really good anecdote here, and also um, alternative like our Sleep It Off mask makes a great alternative for this as well, just keeping the skin healthy. These are two, again, signs of those different types of inflammation from mild to starting to see some moderate inflammation here. And then we have the severe inflammation, again, associated with more of a cystic type acne. This is where we see lots of inflammation, lots of pustular activity, uh, lots of soreness, uh, lots of in increased glandular activity here, um, lots of potential for post-inflammatory pigmentation and scarring. The remedies here are clearly to see a physician first. However, I do want to recommend that because even though grade four cystic acne is outside our scope of practice to treat the acne itself, I'm still one to recommend things topically that are going to help with the other conditions associated with this type of acne. So soreness, pain, inflammation, uh, all of that we can help with certain topical agents as well as through treatment. One being, like for instance, the LED blue treatment on cystic acne, phenomenal to relieve help, relieve pain, I should say, and also to relieve inflammation associated with that type of lesion. So back to strategies to correct, I think we should aim at the following. We have to clear the active acne first. Without this, we're going to still get the onset of acne when we're trying to chase some of the other byproduct of acne. Um, such as post-inflammatory pigmentation, inflammation, dark spots, um, you know, all the other things that we see. So we've got to clear the active acne first. The second to that is then to lessen the inflammation associated with the acne. Uh, this is all done through treatment and home care. Then obviously prevention of any scarring. This is just the uh, potential uh, enlarging of the poor orifice, or maybe it's bridge scarring when multiple follicles are infected, uh, or maybe it's even worse than that. Maybe it's tissue irregulation where we're seeing uh, ice pick dense scarring or more severe types of scarring. Um, so with scarring is, again, outside of our scope of practice to recommend anything to improve scarring, but prevention is really everything. We want to relieve from any psychological stress uh, that could be resulting uh, or contributing to acne. So again, for the clients at home, they need to do their share too. So this is really both from our perspective as well as what the client can do at home so that we can come together with a treatment plan that's going to yield results. So early treatment of acne is really recommended in order to prevent the onset or potential scarring. A healthy skincare regimen beginning in teen years can absolutely ward off some acne in general. So I always say it's never too early to start. When our clients as early as 12, 13, 14 start to see some hormonal fluctuations or changes in the skin, it's then that we want to get them on a really diligent home care regimen and facial regimen so that we can continue to keep their skin in a healthy state and correct before that acne even happens. 
So again, overall tips for our clients, make sure that they're washing their face twice a day with a corrective cleanser. In our case, the uh, cleanse as needed uh, every couple of days seems to work well in tandem with the cleanse, need, cleanse daily. Um, and with the real oily acne clients, the corrective cleansers like the cleanse as needed seem to be okay every day. You just need to determine each particular client as they are individuals and have individual needs. Um, we stay away from the type of alkaline pH soaps or bars of soaps. These types of alkaline pH soaps stimulate the production of oil. These increased oil productions involved a lot to do with, I should say, on the development of these adult type blemishes. So again, staying away from bars of soap, not only are they clogging, but that alkalinity is also stimulating more oil. Uh, recommend a use of a corrector at night uh, onto clean skin after cleansing, such as our Fix It, uh, which is our 2% salicylic acid. This is ideal to eliminate inflammation and to kill the active bacterium and to exfoliate inside the follicle as well as outside. We also must keep the skin in balance. Just know that most anecdotes for acne can be a little dehydrating. Uh, and so it's good to make sure that we keep giving that skin that big drink of water. Our daily dose of water, again, is perfect for that. So keep the skin very hydrated. This will help to prevent those microcomedones from forming an excessive production of sebum just by balancing out the oil and water. And really make sure that your clients are not touching, rubbing the face anywhere, making sure they're changing their sheets and pillowcases on a regular basis, uh, their cleansing um, cloths at home, things like that really need to be uh, coached as well. Now, one of the things that I love, and I've been doing this for over 30 years with my clients, is I ice for inflammation. So I encourage my clients to create that overnight remedy with ice cubes. Rub ice cubes over the, the outbreaks until the skin feels a little numb, keeping the ice moving, not keeping it stationary at all, and removing the ice cubes um, until your skin warms up again and then continue again. So off and on and off and on, usually about two to three minutes on, two to three minutes off intermittently for about 10 to 15 minutes a night. I have found this remedy works like magic. So when your clients are really struggling with that big inflamed acne lesion or all over breakout of a grade two or three or even cystic acne, I love this as a remedy to reduce that inflammation. It actually brings down the inflammation quite rapidly. And again, inflammation can be just as much of a culprit in the formation of scars than the acne pore itself. Um, there are some diet nutritional things to keep into consideration for the clients. Um, I do print this out and give it to my client to take home. It's not something I spend a lot of time on. However, I do recommend that they see a nutritionist as well because there is such a thing as a healthy diet. Uh, can mean healthy skin. Um, just by fueling the skin and the body with what it needs to be as healthy as possible. Obviously, all your fruits and veggies, high concentrations of antioxidants, all of the water that we need. And believe it or not, everything that I've read is that nuts are really good for the treatment of acne. They're very rich in the gamma linoleic acids. Uh, these linoleates are really great as they're essential fatty acids. Um, and um, they can really contribute to the keratinization of the ducts. So I love to recommend nuts that are rich in linoleic acid for my clients. They should avoid high animal fats, uh, moderate use of sweets, any food allergies that they should be looking at. Um, watch their cycles and write down foods that they eat. Sometimes it could be uh, associated with, with food intake. Uh, if that's the case, eliminate as a process of elimination, I should say, eliminate certain things from your diet to see if it changes the way that your skin's behaving. Also, um, foods high in bioflavonoids or alpha lipoic acids are really good because it helps to rid free radicals in the skin. Uh, I love green tea also as a really strong antioxidant, also very high in polyphenols, which really help to fuel uh, healthy skin. There are some things to take into consideration also. Uh, this has been studied quite widely. Whatever manifests on the skin, does it have anything to do with certain indigenous uh, organs? 
uh, or systems within the skin or within the body, and your acne may be trying to tell you something. Um, clearly, what we see a lot in the T zone in the teens is just, again, the onset of uh, increased sebaceous activity. But once our clients are starting to stride in their 30s, there may be other things going on systemically. And remember that the skin really is our window of what's going on inside. Some myths and misconceptions here, although we know that 85% uh, of the world's population is going to suffer from acne at some point or another, I think it's really a good idea that we don't perpetuate some of the misconceptions that are out there. The first and foremost is, can acne be cured? And I never really talk about curing acne. I talk about controlling it. Acne can be cured is a definite myth. There is no cure for acne. It really can only be controlled. However, I do talk to my clients about preventative care for those that may have genetic tendencies for the onset of acne, corrective care for those that come in with an active acne condition, and then prolonged maintenance to help to control that. I never really talk about it going away for good because it just simply doesn't work that way. Some other observations, um, I do think that it's really seriously uh, should be taken into consideration that adolescents or teens are super sensitive to this, uh, and so how we communicate with our teens about their acne really has uh, a large impact on how they're feeling. Um, and it can have some scarring, both physical and psychological. There's lots of effective treatments for acne, this which is what makes our uh, passion and our role so exciting is that we can actually see results with these clients. So acne treatments really uh, can be required for sometimes months and sometimes years. So we have to also be careful when we talk about um, the frequency or how long it might take for us to start to see some clearing. 60% of acne is mild and requires a very active treatment in the beginning and then maybe a maintenance plan with some topical products for home care just to avoid relapses. The more severe acne sufferers may need to see you more regularly and for longer periods of time. Keep in mind that 50% of teenage acne, when left untreated, can persist into adult acne for lots of years. So prevention is really everything, both on teens as well as as it gets into their young teen years. So the real rational approach to treating acne is really the first prevention. Second is to control oil. Third is to prevent the rupture of these comedones by keeping them clean. Fourth is to resolve the inflammation when treating acne. And if you remember these four preventative and maintenance guidelines when providing a treatment plan or home care, you're going to see the results that the clients are looking for. Fifth, we want to prevent and correct scars from even happening. Although when clients are asking about scars, you really want to manage their expectations because there are very little things and modalities that we have behind the chair that can actually correct pre-existing acne scars, but we can prevent. We know that light microdermabrasion and peels and micropeels can superficially soften the appearance of some scars, but I would stay clear from making any um, uh, claims with that. So the approach, there's not really one single best approach approach here because each form of acne may determine a different approach. So we have to look at the type of lesions, um, the duration of the condition, how long have they had it, past and present responses to treatment, what have they used in the past, what's worked, what hasn't worked for them. Do they have tendency for scarring or hyperpigmentation or known as post-inflammatory pigmentation from acne? Is there inflammation currently or present in the skin? And what does their current home care regimen or medications look like? We know that most clients that suffer from acne have or already are on some sort of topical medication as well, whether it be over the counter and or by prescription. Knowing the symptoms and treating acne early and adequately are the keys to a successful acne management. So making sure we also identify if they're on any medications, including any oral contraceptives or corticosteroids, topical antibiotics, all of these can affect the treatment and or the response or time to your treatment. 
Uh, also some overall hygiene, making sure they're on the appropriate home care. They could be using all the wrong products for their condition. Hair grooming products are also sometimes culprits and the use of inappropriate cosmetics can also be considered. So uh, what type of foundation are your teen girls wearing or for that matter, adult women? Um, what are they currently using like in the way of pomades or hair grooming materials that could be causing breakouts in the forehead, which we see a lot. So taking all those things into consideration will help us create the treatment plan. Also, two important points that acne clients themselves should be aware of. In the first six to eight weeks, you're not going to see much change. It does take time. Everything that we do in the way of treatment and for home care is cumulative, so it may require some time before they start to see improvement. So again, managing your client's expectations is paramount. Also, Keep in mind that body lesions on the back, chest, shoulders respond slower to topical applications and services than those on the face. So they might see uh, a little bit slower uh, clearing on the body. Also, um, we want to make sure in treatment we're doing the best things possible. So we know that extractions play a, a really important role um, by removing blackheads, melia, and these soft closed comedones. We can pr reduce the amount of acne lesion breakouts for that client, um, but we are not permitted to extract again cyst or very serious lesions. Um, make sure that those are extracted by dermatologists only. Um, like chemical peels, I love both the alpha and the beta hydroxy acid peels, depending on the other skin conditions that are associated. I tend to lean more towards salicylic, clearly, um, but these can greatly improve acne by removing dead skin cells and helping to clear the pores of any debris and allowing the skin to function normally. So obviously for any clients that are going through a very mild to moderate acne, my first choice is the salicylic peel due to its antimicrobial and great exfoliation properties, as well as it's a very strong uh, anti-inflammatory. So it seems to be really good for those that suffer from more of an inflamed acne. Uh, microdermabrasion, again, a great modality to help exfoliate the skin, loosen up the debris from deep within the pore. Uh, that micro massage helps to stimulate and coax out those plugs. Also, um, we can see uh, a little bit of a detox happening through the stimulation process as well. So it's best for those that have a non-inflamed acne condition uh, because it's a little bit difficult and sometimes a little bit discomforting for the client when we're working over an inflamed type. So I suggest that we clear as much as the inflammation and active acne lesions first before we begin them on a microdermabrasion uh, course. Love, love, love the blue LED. This modality is really great used in conjunction with lots of other modalities to help to destroy bacterial growth deep within the pores that when left untreated can lead to a more inflamed condition. So blue LED is very passive, very benign, uh, ideal for reducing inflammation associated with grade three and four acne. And again, in our cystic acne, even though we're not treating the cystic acne itself, we can certainly improve the conditions surrounding that acne condition, such as redness and inflammation with the blue LED. Just a phenomenal modality in the treatment room. Um, some topical treatments at home. Again, uh, I am not a big fan of benzoyl peroxide. Uh, there is better technology available. Salicylic acid has been widely used as a topical anecdote for or a remedy for acne for years due to its extreme safety. When recommended uh, in the correct way, it has great comedolytic activity, uh, which just is amazing to help break up any debris within the pore um, and creates desquamation or shedding or sloughing to remove the top layer of skin and also any hypocornification of dead skin cells in the interior of the pore. It just really dissolves and breaks it up and allows the skin to ex uh, export it. Um, this helps to, to prevent the follicles from getting really plugged. I love it. It's also great to destruct that P. acne bacterium that's present and shows moderate antibacterial efficacy. This is a perfect anecdote for those that want to cut that acne off at its path before it even becomes inflamed. 
love this because of its strong anti-inflammatory agent as well. Um, compared to benzoyl peroxide, most BPOs can actually cause excessive dehydration and more inflammation. So uh, th there again lies my choice, uh, why my choice is salicylic acid. Benzoyl peroxide also is a known uh, irritant. You can also build up some tolerance to it. Uh, it can make the skin very hardened, and over the course of time, the skin just doesn't respond to it. So, and again, in 35 years, I have found that salicylic acid is a better anecdote for, again, multiple reasons. When should your client see a doctor? Uh, obviously, when the more severe acne uh, is occurring, uh, definitely cystic acne, uh, or if you're really plateauing and struggling, keep in mind, uh, working in conjunction with a local physician is ideal uh, as opposed to working against. Sometimes it takes both topical medications by a physician as well as a good uh, home care and facial regimen by a licensed esthetician. But medical treatment would be based on the severity of the acne condition itself. I would suggest that on a grade three or four, it's maybe time to see a physician. Um, we know that doctors are going to go about treating these conditions differently. So this is what you can really expect to happen when your clients go see a doctor. Um, even grades one, which is a mild form of non-inflamed acne, it's not uncommon for our doctors to treat with topical retinoids, uh, retinoic acid, um, some benzoyl peroxide, some hydroquinones uh, for the prevention of post-inflammatory pigmentation. All this is to be expected. Um, for mild to moderate acne grades two and three, it's also not uncommon for them to start prescribing oral, oral antibiotics and in some cases hormonal therapy for females. I have found in a lot of cases this helps to subsidize what we're doing in the treatment room greatly. Um, the treatment of severe acne is usually either by an isotretinoid or a combination of different meds, both orally and topically. So again, working with physicians is best. Um, what we do best is to find the right home care regimen that's going to meet the needs of the client based on the conditions that are associated with not only their acne condition, but the topical medications or oral meds that they may be on. So, again, finding ways to balance out the oil and water in the skin is something we can do. We can work on reducing inflammation with topical, safe, plant-based anti-inflammatories. We can help keep the pores clean at home with topical use of a low-grade salicylic. All of those are ways to work in conjunction with not against these other therapies prescribed by doctors. Also, um, extractions play a huge role. Now, a lot of facials are looked at as being relaxing and luxuriant and painless and steaming and exfoliating and gentle massages, and all of that is a big part of what we need to do. The experience of our clients really means sometimes more to them than the outcome of the service. However, when it comes to acne, it's a little bit different. Uh, clinical results driven facials, however, especially when it comes to acne, can be a slightly different story. These can sometimes be slightly uncomfortable at times, uh, and it requires a higher level of expertise. I really feel like if you're going to tackle acne, we need to really understand everything about it, when and when and when not, outside of our scope of practice, should we be doing anything. And the key difference is your extraction methods and success in the treatment of acne behind the chair. So why extractions? Obviously, we know that we can draw out the pore clogging sebum, but precise technique and general pressure, we have to be careful not to scar or tear the skin is paramount. So with luck, these plugs should just coax out from the pore. Sometimes they need a little support. Um, and if that's the case, then we've got great topicals to help support that. Um, we know that the, the regular extraction techniques done in regular facials really can help reduce uh, onset of more breakouts for our acne clients, uh, or for all clients for that matter. So we must extract. There's also always something to extract. Even though it may not be uh, identified by oxidation or a dark spot or a dark um, amount of filament in the pore, we still have a very clear to a milky white filament that remains inside the pores. Um, this filament, again, can uh, create that, that bacteria to fester and acne lesions could occur. So even removing of all of that milky white filament 
uh, up through oxidation or our oxidized plugs like in dark or black comedones should all be removed when when, it, when we can. Um, keep in mind also that a lot of filament in the pore can stretch the pore opening permanently. And so just by keeping the, the, the pores clean, uh, we'll keep that orifice or pore opening in check. Um, and keep in mind also the scarring could be an end result when all of this bacteria, fatty acids, and other material, such as dead skin cells, are laying dormant in those pores or follicles. Um, this is when we sometimes see, again, the onset of white blood cells, which could lead to um, pus formation, which then could affect the surrounding healthy tissue. That leads to scars. So there's no question that extractions play a major ally in the quest for clear skin for your clients. So this is just to depict these different types of lesions, what to extract. I think we're safe to extract all of these uh, when necessary because, again, we're not identifying the grade 4 cystic acne. We're just identifying a closed comedone, open comedone, uh, papule, and pustule here. Um, so clearly, these all have abilities to be uh, extracted. Now, in some cases, when there is uh, growth or skin growth over the, the pore opening, it can make it a little tricky. In some states, we are not allowed to use um, our extraction tools and or anything to puncture the skin, so it makes it very difficult. So we have to be very careful not to apply too much pressure uh, when there is a closed comedone involved here uh, because it could go bad. Um, when should we extract? Really only when there's a prominent open lesion. You don't want to force your extractions too much. Um, prepping the skin really is mandatory in order to soften the filament first and provide less trauma to the skin. So liquefy the filament as much as possible through your topical agents like our pre-squeeze. Uh, the pumpkin is ideal for that. Um, moist heat like steam, warm towels, all that really helps to liquefy the filament. And when shouldn't we extract? Clearly when we're working again on cystic acne. This is really likely to leave scars. You don't want to be responsible for that. This may be associated with some poor type acne lesions, um, but in most cases, I would recommend in the severity that they see a physician. So how do we extract correctly? There's lots of different ways to do it. Um, there are two methods, but there are many different extraction techniques. The two methods <clears throat> clearly is the manual method, which is um, by uh, wrapping your fingers in cots and four by fours or gloves or using your tool. It's recommended that performing extractions is the only time that it's mandated for gloves. Um, the different types of manual extractions I've created, and you can create your own. Um, I have different techniques for different types of lesions. Um, the squeeze technique is when I can reach up underneath and squeeze up. I also have the wiggle technique for those real difficult ones where I'm just using my forefingers and wiggling it out. Um, the scooping technique is when I can get underneath a larger plug. And then I have the scaling technique, which is done with my tool. Uh, the first three, the squeeze, the wiggle, and the scooping techniques, I use with gloves and wrapped fingers. The scaling technique I use with um, just this comedone extracting tool. On the scaling technique, I leave the pre-squeeze on because I want some slip to the surface of the skin. But if I'm doing a manual extraction technique, like the three mentioned above, I will make sure I thoroughly remove any pre-extraction product. You don't want to slip or create any um, streaks in the skin. Um, ex extractions can go bad. We talked a little bit about when you don't extract, and there are some risks involved, and uh, we can lead to more in bacterial infection, increased irritation. We can distend capillaries or put pressure on the vascularity of the skin. We can see a dip, additional acne problems start to occur. And in worst case scenarios, we see that inappropriate extraction can even cause some scarring. So having said that, um, poorly performed extractions are pretty painful, but when they're done right, um, they may be a little uncomfortable. It really shouldn't hurt too much. I want to show you what happens when you see infections such as swelling, redness, or pus formation uh, in the, the follicle itself. When you squeeze an infected follicle, you can create pressure that can spread the infection, as depicted here in this picture. 
The infection then can spread above the skin, but also deep inside the pores. This can enlarge the pore and spread the infection and cause increased scarring. So you can see how now it's outside the follicular lining and it's deep within the epidermis itself, creating an onset of secondary inflammation there um, and pus formation, not only within the follicle, but on the surface of the skin and within the tissue itself. So you can see where it can burst. And when we put too much pressure on it, we see that happen a lot. Um, and so again, don't apply more pressure than needed. When damage is severe enough, scar tissue then forms. And that's where we start to get the depression or the pit scarring. Um, so don't apply too much pressure or you may worsen the condition. Uh, again, coaxing it out with your pre-squeeze products in treatment and really keeping those filaments soft so at, with home care so the next time they come in, they're a lot easier to treat. Scarring is a long-term effect of acne. It may look uneven. In some cases, you have discoloration, um, but this is what you don't want to see. This is an example of some uh, self-extractions uh, at home uh, or allowing those acne lesions to just fester or left untreated, and therefore it's affecting the healthier tissue around the pore opening. Uh, how much should you extract per visit? I say it's up to 10 minutes. Sometimes we need to cut back a little bit on massage time. Uh, with inflamed acne, sometimes massage can be eliminated altogether just because it's uncomfortable. But I really don't recommend that we extract more than 10 minutes per facial as it becomes a little bit discomforting for the client as well. So I want to talk briefly about the ideal treatment plan for acne. This is basically in home care as well in services. And this is just kind of a blueprint for you, which I have found to work very successfully for me in my practice. Um, I recommend that I see a client for no less than six consecutive weeks. Um, and ideally, uh, the more frequently they can come in for these services, the better. Um, frequency does matter. But it really ups, is up to your clients, both in budget and time, what they can come in. So do the best you can within the services. But the first service, I should say, should be like a detox facial with extractions. And I love to add the blue light therapy. Um, this is when we're really kind of detoxing the skin and clearing it out. Two weeks after that, I love the standalone salicylic acid peel with no extractions. By this time, they're using the topicals at home, um, such as the Fix It, and they should discontinue the use of that for three days prior to receiving the peels and not to resume for three days after. But the use of that Fix It at home is pre actually prepping the skin and going to augment the way that salicylic peel is going to work at this week three. On week five, I'd love to do another detox facial with extractions plus the blue LED and repeat this three-step process as often as necessary, barring any skin irritation. So you can repeat this program uh, back to back. Um, so again, these are three treatments in five to six consecutive weeks. Uh, again, repeating as often as necessary until we start to see some clearing. In the home care, I love the cleanses needed. If it's too much too soon, have them alternate with another cleanser uh, or the cleanse daily. Eventually, their skin could handle it, potentially. If it's a very oily acne, what I call like an orange peel texture, large pores, lots of sebaceous activity, chances are they can handle the cleanses needed every day or twice a day. Also, I'd love to balance out again the water in the skin. So daily dose of water and take your vitamin spray, both really an integral part of the home care regimen. Daily dose of water is just going to balance out again the amount of oil in the skin. It's also going to allow the skin to function normally and keep that filament soft. Take your vitamin spray, amazing, because it also contains all those colloidals to help with inflammation as well as to keep the skin hydrated throughout the day. You can spray this on during, after, and throughout uh, the day uh, before and after makeup as well. Clearly, uh, any skin defense, uh, SPF 30, is necessary uh, as we are um, progressively treating with acids at home and in treatment. Uh, they need to be very cautious because, A, this could increase their sensitivities to UVA exposure, uh, and they could be more uh, of a candidate for the post-inflammatory pigmentation as a result. So 
uh, UVA and UVB broad spectrum defense is really critical in the regimen. In the nighttime for PM, again, cleanse is needed when they can tolerate it. I love fix it about twice a week in the PM is like kind of the sweet spot. But again, if they're a lot more oilier than the average client, then maybe they could handle this a little bit more often as long as it's barring any inflammation, peeling, or redness. It's not uncommon in the first couple of weeks, however, that your clients may see some redness or irritation. That should, should subside, however. Again, always hydrating in the evening, uh, and I love the rehab Mediterranean mud mask two to three times a week, allowing it to completely dry and uh, rehydrating it to remove it. Okay, that concludes our master's class on Let's Talk Acne. If you have any additional questions regarding any products or protocols that I mentioned, please don't hesitate to read out, reach out to us at education at clarityclinicalskincare.com. And be sure to follow us on our social media platforms. On Facebook, we're ClarityRxClinical. On Instagram, we're at Clarity Clinical Skincare or hashtag ClarityRx. And thank you again for joining us today. Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye.